Welcome to that 4x4 show. My name is Bernie Williams and this week we drive a pair of Jeeps. And our disco gets a new interior and I get all cross-axled. But up first, here are those Jeeps. In the early years of World War II, the American Army decided they needed a light reconnaissance vehicle. And so, a legend was born. Willys and Ford built the Jeep for the American Army. And by the end of the war in 1945, it's said that about 650,000 Jeeps were manufactured and used in the war effort. These machines were basic, but they were tougher than a piece of biltong that lay in the cupboard for three years. They could fly, swim, jump and drive in and out of just about any situation. It really was a legend and it proved such a success that Land Rover, the Toyota Land Cruiser and the Nissan Patrol were born as a direct result of the little Jeep's reputation and abilities. This is a V6 Jeep Wrangler Sahara, probably the best Jeep of all time. One of the main reasons we're making such a bold statement is because of the engine fitted to this Jeep. It's a modern V6 petrol engine that also does service in the Grand Cherokee. The 3.6-litre engine delivers 209 kilowatts of power and 347 newton meters of torque. So this Jeep, which weighs in at 1,750 kilograms, is surprisingly fast. The Shorty Sahara is available only in the five-speed automatic gearbox, but it's a very good marriage between refinement, ability and performance. And in here, it's all very modern and spiffy. The Jeep is actually amazingly luxurious, especially when compared to the original Jeep, which had a steering wheel and a gear lever and not much else. Here you get a feeling of plush, with lots of buttons, a fancy optional infotainment system, aircon, and a reasonably comfortable seating position up front. In the back, it's less rosy, and if you're seven feet tall, you wouldn't like to be cocooned in here. You can even take off the roof. It's like a convertible for the bush. But the process to remove the roof is not quite as easy as one, two, three. In fact, it's a painful exercise. So let's rather just, well, let's just drive it. The Jeep with its solid front and rear axles is quite at home on gravel, and it's still as tough as nails. With all the horses under the bonnet, this Jeep is fun to drive on the gravel and on tar. The power is normally only sent to the rear wheels, but it does have traction control to keep the tail in check. On tar, the shorty Jeep's ride is a bit choppy and uncomfortable, and the steering very American and way too light. Ultimately, it does feel solid and together. This is where a Wrangler makes more sense than a piece of dry horse at a rugby game. The Jeep's traction control system has been programmed for off-road use, so it works pretty well here. All Hannes has to do is keep a constant pressure on the accelerator pedal, and the fancy computer will break wheels and send more horses to other wheels as needed. The traction control on this Jeep works so well. It doesn't feel like a challenge. It feels boring. But we've even brought another Jeep that could be better. That's the Rubicon version. And although it's powered by the same engine, it has a few more tricks up its sleeve. Join us later in the program when we pit the two Jeeps against each other. The Rubicon sure does look the part, but now the diehard Jeep fans are probably going to want to kill me for this, but I don't know if it's worth the extra cash. Tire pressures, a very contentious issue. Do they really make a big difference? The real die-hard 4x4 guy will tell you that it's important to deflate your tires when you start traversing obstacles. But isn't it just one of those urban myths again? There's only one way to find out. Let's try it. Okay, so we're pumping the tires three bar. All right, so we just did a little exercise. Three bar in the tire, 
And we did it the first time without diff lock, first gear, and just let it run on its idle. Second time, we repeated the exercise, but this time with diff lock on. No difference, we still didn't make it to the top. So what we're going to do now is drop these tire pressures to 1.5 bar and then repeat the exercise and see what the difference will be. So in conclusion, yes, it does help to deflate your tires. Remember the first time we went with three bar tires with and without the diff lock and we didn't make it. Second run, we deflated the tires to 1.5 bar. Without the diff lock, we also didn't make it. However, with the diff lock engaged, we made it all the way to the top. And just bear in mind, we just had the car running on its idle. So depending on the kind of terrain that you're traversing, you're going to have to engage the diff lock. And so in conclusion, yes, it does help to deflate your tires when going off-road. I know, I know, I know, it's a hassle, inflating, deflating, but it definitely does have its advantages. Up next, I'm going to show you how to avoid a cross-axle situation. Let me take you back to standard six science. Remember that power will always take the path of least resistance. Why am I telling you this? If you are in a four-wheel drive scenario where you have your center diff locked or you have your hubs locked, you have 25% of the power sent to all four wheels. So you've got 50% in the front, 50% in the rear. Now you get into a situation where you are going to get what we call cross axle. In other words, two opposing wheels that are going to end up in the air. Now, a diff is a wonderful piece of, of mechanism but it can also complicate your life. So what's going to happen here now is that the power is going to be sent to the wheels that have the least resistance. In other words, you're not going to be able to climb up this obstacle without using your diff lock. So what your diff lock in essence does, it will lock the two rear wheels together and both wheels will be turning at the same time. So whether the other wheel is in the air and doesn't have any traction is immaterial because the other wheel will be on the ground and thus ensuring that you have traction and making it possible for you to roll or to move through the obstacle. I'm going to demonstrate it to you, but first I'm going to do it without the diff lock and then I'm going to engage the diff lock and show you how easy it is for you to actually then move through that obstacle successfully. And here we go without the diff lock. Approaching that cross axle situation, let's see what happens. And lo and behold, there we are, not going anywhere. All our power is going to the two wheels that are hanging in the air. Okay, so we have now engaged diff lock, and here we go into the very self sim obstacle. And let's see what happens. Start climbing. We get to the cross axle situation. And lo and behold, the vehicle simply just glides through it. always under control. We spend so much time and money upgrading our 4x4s and sometimes you just have to ask yourself the question, is it worth it? Well, if your 4x4 ends up looking like this, then it is. Meet Icarus, the Land Rover Defender. Icarus started life as a normal 110 station wagon. But then Jeremy Berg from Alucab decided to turn it into the ultimate overlander for two people. The Landy's original roof has been modified and it's now, well, it's a very cool fold-up tent. Two people can comfortably fit into the sleeping area and there's plenty of headroom. The only standard thing on this Landy is the 2.2 litre turbo diesel engine. The rest is all custom. On one side, for instance, a shower can be installed with a hot water supply. The other side is a kitchen. The gas stove lives in the cabin where it's shielded from the elements. 
Since this landy is designed around the requirements of two people, the second row of seats have been removed and in their place now lives a big fridge freezer. Power for all the auxiliary systems is taken care of by a dual battery system and a SeaTech charging system, which is also linked to a roof-mounted solar panel. Under the skin, the Landy is fitted with a TJM gold suspension upgrade and an air suspension at the back to easily handle the extra weight when the fully laden Defender heads out on an adventure. The front and rear bars are courtesy of Gobi X, and besides really looking the part, they are highly practical accessories. On the front bar, Jeremy has mounted a winch, as well as the latest Hella Xenon spotlights. Lumino supplied the spectacular LED light bar fitted to the front runner roof rack, which can turn night into day. Icarus is also fitted with an Easy On LAS Pro 270 awning. Another cool feature is the firewood container on top of the bonnet. It's perfect to store wood for a special campfire in the middle of the Hramadulas. And no, you can't make the fire on the bonnet. If you do, you'll have one big and very spectacular bonfire, and then you'll have to walk a bit. The cabin has also been kitted out comprehensively, from the very cool Caprivi seat covers with leather inserts to a custom panel that lives on top of the existing dashboard. Now the question beckons. How many loans will you have to take out to convert a Defender into a spectacular overlander like this one? Well, not as much as you may think. As it stands here, Icarus's upgrade cost about 280,000 Rand, and that's no small change, but it's not exactly an arm and a leg either. So if you pay just under 500,000 Rand for a new Defender, and add another 300,000 to the kitty to Icarus it up a bit, it's going to cost you about 800,000 Rand. Which isn't cheap, but it's still cheaper than a fancy house next to the sea, which you can't pack up and take with you. Check out the November issue of Leisure Wheels for more detailed information on the mighty Icarus. If you've done all of that to your 4x4, you seriously need a place to take it and to test it. Just northwest of Pretoria, a rock's throw from Hartepiersburg Dam and Brit, is the DeVilt 4x4 game park. 4x4 track is located on the northern slopes of the Mahadisburg Mountains. And this venue is said to have been specifically designed with 4x4 enthusiasts in mind. It offers 4x4 families a very convenient, scenic and entertaining day out of the city. A swimming pool will impress the kids. And there are also bright facilities and a pub which will impress the parents. If you want to stay over for an extended bit of fun, you can either camp or stay in the venue's log cabins or tents. But let's talk 4x4. Cool feature of this venue is that although there are a number of rather daunting obstacles, you don't absolutely have to do them all. So it's an optional thing. You either do it or you don't. What this means is that you can negotiate most of the tracks in a soft rotor with adequate ground clearance and traction. There are a few obstacles that cater for enthusiasts who dig a bit of tough. Kind of tough that no soft rotor will survive. This is the obstacle known as Gertz Cliff, or Gertz Rock. It's a very steep climb up a rocky face. It does look rather scary, but here you simply have to commit and go for it, once you've chosen the ideal line. Another challenge is the Rock River. Here you have to choose your line most carefully, and it will also help if you have a spotter that can point out imminent disaster lurking behind a rock. Once you've made it to the top of the mountain, there are some very scenic viewing points where you can ponder the meaning of life and so on. Another attraction is the actual game on the farm. You can see giraffe, jackal and various other wild grass-eating mammals. It takes about three hours to complete the entire route. And as we've said before, 
If you're looking for a fun Sunday afternoon outing for the family, this is about as good as it can get for 4x4 enthusiasts who don't want to drive 500 kilometers. Also on the menu, by the way, are mountain biking tracks and 4x4 courses. For more information on the Devilt 4x4 game park, visit our website. Up next, we have our disco getting a splash new interior, a dash modification, and the deal between the Jeep Rubicon and Sahara gets really, really serious. After visiting with Dan Green from Green Oval for several months, our much improved looking Landy was finally ready for the next stage of its upgrade. It was time to tackle the suspension and the dilapidated interior. Dan kindly towed the much better looking Landy to Pretoria North and the Conqueror Connection workshop. Well, the suspension has clearly got a lot of mileage on it, a lot of wear and tear. We're going to fit the Tough Dog suspension system, the adjustable 41mm ball foam sole shock, which is going to give you a lift of a plus, uh, approximately 40 millimeters higher. Now, with the Muddler tyres we're going to fit on here, it's going to help you a lot in your off-road situation. As you can see here, the shocks that came with the Landy were not really shocks anymore. They just looked like shocks, but provided absolutely no damping whatsoever. Anyway, more on this trick suspension when the landing is done. It was time to head west again, all the way to AK Leather in Victoria West. Here owner Johan Klitter and his team tackled the sorry looking roof lining and the overused seat trimmings. Johan, I guess so now we've taken the cover off the seat, what happens from here? So what we're going to do now is we're going to strip this, um, the, the, the original cover mm -hmm. and we're going to make a pattern from this to suit the um, seat here. And then on the inside of the, the covers you will see on the seams, we put in a tape here on the seam, that is we call this a listing tape. And in this listing tape there's a little wire going in there, that goes in there. And then that goes back in there and then we, we tie it down there. Okay. So when you pull it over, it pulls then, it tight. It, then it gives you all the different shapes again. Okay. So it pulls okay. the, the leather in the, the, the corners and into the, the shapes here. Then of okay. course on the edges, the, the, the seams here, we will then double top stitch them. Okay. Uh, and I think at this stage we're talking about a, an orange color that we will use. And that's that for this week. Next week, the Landy gets a very fancy new dashboard to replace the original one. If only they would fit the windscreen, I could take it for a drive one of these days. Earlier in the program, Hannes took the Rubicon and the Sahara Jeeps and fitted them against each other. And I want to know, and I'm sure you also want to know, is all the extras on the Rubicon really worth the extra money? Let's find out. This is a very rapid and loose obstacle. Let's see if the Sahara and the Rubicon can crawl up here. Just about any old 4x4 can get up here if you hit the base at 60 k's an hour and don't give a hoot about dents and scrapes and broken mechanical parts. To go slowly up here is another game. Let's select low range and let's see if the traction control works as well on this obstacle. The Jeep climbs and climbs and watch the wheels stop and turn and stop and turn. Amazingly, it makes it all the way to the top. Never mind the electronics, wheels in contact with the ground means forward momentum can be maintained. And the Sahara's very good wheel articulation allows it to do just that. Traction control feels it's working well and the suspension travel even feels very good. Next up is the Rubicon. It also has traction control, but as soon as low range is selected, the computer goes on holiday. Now the Rubicon has to rely on its even more spectacular articulation, sheer mechanical grip, lower gear ratios, and manual gearbox, and the option of the two locking diffs. But let's first see how far the Rubicon will get without any of its tricks. Let's select low range, first gear, diff locks disconnected, sway bar still connected, Let's see if it can do it.
I can see that without the electronics and the dev locks off, this one is not so happy. But it goes pretty well. Amazingly, the Jeep makes it up, relying only on the sheer mechanical grip of the 4x4 system, a practiced accelerator foot, and the grunt of the 209 kilowatt engine. Let's try it with the front and rear div locks engaged and the sway bar disconnected. Now it's so easy. It's almost, well, it's not even fun anymore. The red Rubicon putters up the hill, no mess, no fuss. This feels so good with the div locks on and the sway bar disconnected. It's got a lot of suspension articulation. So, which one is better then? The Sahara or the Rubicon? The Sahara is probably the better option if you want to use the Jeep as a daily driver around town and now and then go bundu bashing. Even in the Sahara specification, the Wrangler is extremely capable off-road and it will make any driver look like a champion. The Rubicon is the more hardcore option for Jeep owners who go and play on rough 4x4 tracks every weekend. The Jeep fanatics will also tell you that because of the lower gear ratios in the Rubicon version, you can fit bigger wheels without worrying about upgrading gearbox and diff ratios. So it's a better base on which to build a personalized, bigger wheeled Wrangler. Maybe the best news of all is that the Rubicon sells for just 25,000 Rand more than the Sahara. So for just over 400k, you can buy yourself a not so practical, but an oh so extremely capable 4x4. I'm very impressed with both the vehicles, the Sahara and the Rubicon. But my choice will be the Rubicon because it, of its lower ratios and also its div locks. I think it could be probably the ultimate in 4 x 4 Thank you, Hannes. I certainly know which one I'd have. That's it for this week, folks. Next week, we have a budget test for you on an SUV, and we will show you how and when to use engine braking. Please, in the meantime, remember, guys, keep left, pass right. Catch all the latest motoring news in Leisure Wheels magazine. If you want more information about that 4x4 show, find us on Facebook. There you will also find more information about that 4x4 trip in conjunction with Leisure Wheels magazine. That 4x4 show brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion.